for homecoming in the winter, we've talked to some of you guys, some of the people in your class to kind of get you a head start. Uh, we're either going to do a, you're either going to decorate a float for a parade, or, or the senior hallway. You guys would rather do a float for a parade? Okay. All right, so here's what we're doing. We're going we're gonna to give a long lunch, and then the proceeds from that long lunch, we're going to give back it to each class. So each class will do a float. Okay? The winning class is going to get an extra long lunch for everybody that participates in decorating the float. So you got to come participate to get that extra long lunch. We'll, we'll, we'll decide on that. We're going to have to kind of look at weather and all that stuff. So that's one thing that's coming. Okay, second of all, October, Eagle Boy and Girl this month. I need Sarah Hartman and Josh Steik. like some of our young folks, a lot of our younger people <laughs> in the bank or in college or whatever, without me having a couple of my major points that I want you to make sure you hear. So we'll start out. I, I'm, I don't, I'm, we're no, we won't make any political statements. I'll tell you the two most important relationships and the two things, two skills that I want you to have, and then we'll get into why it's so important that we have some personal finance skills. But the, the two relationships I'll tell you is your relationship with God and whoever your life partner is going to be. If you can't figure those two out, you're going to have a problem. If you do figure those two out, things are going to be a lot easier, okay? The two skills I'm going to tell you that you've got to have, and I always joke around, we've got, we've got some great young people that work at our bank, uh, super smart. A lot of them are going on to either stay in our bank or they're going to do something else. I tell them all the time, and I just kind of say it jokingly, but I'm not joking. I said, I don't care what you get your degree in, give me two skills that make sure you get them. People skills and personal finance. Okay? If you know how to make a lot of money, but you get home and you don't know how to take care of it, it really doesn't matter. And if you don't want to be somebody, or you don't know how to be somebody that other people get along with, life won't be very fun. So you can have a four point and be a total dork and not know how to talk to anybody, 
I don't really care that much about hiring you. You got to develop that, right? Uh, now you can. They don't have to. Everybody doesn't have to be the most outgoing person in the world. Okay, you can still be super smart and learn some of those people skills. Just how to get along with people. I don't mean you have to be want to speak in front of people all the time, but you got to have some people skills. And then you've got to be able to take care of your own money. Okay, does that make sense? That's why I'm so glad that they're ha they're, they're having these senior seminars. We've got some people I know that are coming behind us. Some of my good friends that are bankers, I think, will be here. That uh, one of my uh, Mr. Smith's, uh, one of his friends, and he had growing up. Uh, I may have to get y'all to shoot a video with me before we're done. And one of my friends is a, owns one of the Chick Fil A's in Oklahoma City. You can imagine he does very well, but he's a great speaker, and uh, and he is going to be here later in the year as well. But one of the things I want to talk to you about. Uh, and he'll talk a lot more about it, is making money, but to give you some perspective, I want to give you some perspective. I want to tell you a little bit about, it's more important that you know what to do and not just how much you make, right? So I'll give you a quick example. This is not me, you couldn't figure that out. Um, however, I was, I was fortunate enough, I, when I was y'all's age, all I could really think about was sports, basketball and baseball, and I was gonna play professional baseball. Went on, played college baseball, got drafted by the Cardinals, and so um, I was able to play for the Cardinals organization. When you get in the minor leagues, that does not mean that you've signed a big contract yet, okay? So for me, now this has changed a little bit. This is early 2000s for me. Um, Grady, I can pick on you. What do you think my monthly salary was my first contract in professional baseball? Not my signing bonus. I'm talking about when you actually get paid every two weeks and then that adds up to four weeks in a month. What do you think my monthly was? Uh, 5300 5, a month. Yes, okay. Should be 5300 a month, right? Yes. Now, I this is when you're first drafted, right? Well, what round did you go into? No, it wasn't bonus. So what bonus round? doesn't matter. I was in 30, I was 30 seconds, but that doesn't matter. Right? But the bonus is what matters. I'm talking about your monthly, like how much you get paid, what you got a budget on. $850 a month. Now that's changed. That's changed. Matter of fact, one of my good friends is a lawyer and they have a suit that you can go look up that's changed how minor leaguers get paid now before you get there. So you hear all these things about people making money. Lots of people don't. Now this is my friend Max. Max Scherzer. Go to the next slide. You have another quick over that's when he won the World Series or won, won a playoff game. Um, there's, there's, another, there's, a, there's Max now. Okay, so Max slept on my floor. So when I was in college and I was, you know, I was doing, I was an upperclassman, and so the, the guys coming out of high school, they come stay with you and you take them through the weekend, have quite a bit of fun, right? So Max was one of my recruits, so I thought Max was just like a little high school kid. I did not know Max was going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. So Max, is still pitching. He's only a couple years younger than me. He's the playoff with the Mets right now. Anybody, anybody got a phone that they can use to do some calculations? Anybody? You can get your phone out. Coach Gold says it. Go for it. Okay, you ready? Tell me when you're at the calculator. Okay, so Max, he's already made 210 million and plus with the Nationals and some other people. So now this year's contract is 140 million with the Mets, right? So he's 43 million a year. So you can put 43 million in there? That one you got. Max pitched, and going into the playoffs, he pitched 145 in okay? So take that number and divide it by 145. What we got? Probably 296,000. Yeah. No, that's all right. That's all right. 296,000 and what? 296,000. That's what Max makes every three outs. Just right around 300,000. So Max slept on my floor, and this year Max makes 100,000 an out. Every time he gets an out, he makes 100 grand. Ground ball, second base, 100 grand. <laughs> right? So 
the deal is, most people are probably not going to have, oh, by the way, Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Participants may have some surprises coming. I can fill them to the back. So, what we're going to talk about is what happens if you don't make $43 million a year. Okay? And most people, even if you get really close, like I kind of did, I ended up making a little more than eight hundred fifty a month. But it's like one of one of the things my dad always told me is I've seen a lot of people make a lot a lot of money and not have very much of it, and I've seen some people that you actually wouldn't have thought had that much money, and they were able to keep all of it. Okay, we're going to talk about you have to be able to manage it, and so we see it on a daily basis. Now we don't get to tell everybody, but one of the things I will tell you. Um, as a banker, everything is confidential, right? So we know that we don't tell your, we can't, it's against the law. We can never tell your personal information. What would surprise you is there's some people driving new vehicles, and what I know is in their checking account is not very much, and they're barely making it. And there's some people just buying, just, just, just driving a good old beat up truck that they've had paid for for 10 years, and their bank account is a lot bigger than anybody knows. Okay? That makes sense? So we're going to start at the very foundational basis. So as we talk about some of these things today, before you guys go to lunch, please know some of it is going to be like, yeah, I already know that. I get it. Like, we, we're, not, we're not done. But there's going to be some things that you haven't heard about, and I also want you to know, you just raise your hand and ask questions. Say, Mr. Roper, Derek, just a second. I don't understand what you're saying. Okay? This is, we're not going to just sit here and talk at you. Okay? Paige, this is Paige Clark, as Mr. Noel mentioned. Paige is, not only is she our, we call it our store manager in our, in our organization. Really that means our operations manager. I'll give you a couple of different things about how, a, the, in the financial world, how that works. Typically, you have people kind of on the loan side. I do a lot of loans, whether you're building a building here, you're building an office building, or you're, you're wanting to buy, maybe you're wanting to buy a car. I mean, I can help you with that too, but a lot of times those are, those are some bigger things. And then all the things that happen with transactions. Think about every day the stuff that's going through Legacy Bank, okay? And all of the accounts that are open, all the people that have a checking account, right? So that's kind of your operations side. That's where you're actually obviously holding your money. That's Paige. Now Paige knows a little bit about both sides, but Paige oversees all that. If you come out and you get in college at Southwestern and you want to go to work at Legacy Bank, you will work under Paige. Okay? So Paige has got a great understanding of how your checking account, how things hit. We're gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute. So as I go, as we go through our outline a little bit, and we start at the very, very beginning. Okay? One of the first things that's important is understanding. So how many people have a checking account already? Good. Good. You kind of keep up with it on your own for the most part? How do you do that? Is this the homecoming king? Congratulations. <laughs> Remind me of your name? Yeah. Fidel. Heard good things about you, Fidel. Do you have your own checking account? How do you keep up with it? Online. Online. Okay, we're going to talk about that here in a minute. How did you know uh, which one to choose? Okay. Okay. No. Good start. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Paige, and I'm going to ask her questions too, and you guys ask as we go along. Paige, tell us a little bit about our checking accounts and how do you know uh, which one you might need or what you might want, please. Hi, guys. I'm not near as fun as Derek. I don't have fun sports stories, but I know about banking. So, whenever you're looking for a bank to start your first checking account, some things that you want to look for are fees that the bank might charge you, so monthly service fees, uh, fees for check printing, getting a debit card. Um, you also want to be mindful of the other services that that bank can offer you, so you want to make sure that their mobile app technology is important to you. You want to make sure the mobile app has features that you want, so being able to mobile deposit, keep track of transactions in real time, anything like that is going to be really important. Um, you also want to be sure that, I mean, you like it. You want to like going in there. You want people to make you happy. So one of the best things about us at Legacy Bank is that our uh, Square One checking account offers cash back. 
So whenever you swipe your debit card, you're going to get paid for using your debit card with us. So transactions from $10 to $25, you get $0.10 cents back. $25 to $100, you get $0.25 cents back. And then anything over $100, you get a dollar back. And that's just all put in your account at the end of the month. Does that make sense? So Legacy, you're going to hear some things later on. We're talking about credit cards. And Legacy, we pay on our checking account. We pay you to have a checking account if you use it right. Does that... Does that make sense? So you want to look and see, and we're not just advertising for Legacy Bank. But you want to look and see, okay, when I open up a checking account, I'm going to use it, does it have a card? And which bank is going to pay me? I want to make more with my money, right? Those are things we want to think about. Okay, talk about checks. You want to do it? Yep. So I get a checking account open, there's usually two ways I can spend it, or three ways, I guess, right? I can go get cash out of the bank, right? I can use my card, or I can write a check. Checks are, there's less and less checks, but let's talk about how that works. Can we do that? So, like Eric said, we're going to say some things that might seem pretty basic to some of you, but we're going to start at the bottom and work our way up. So, this is a check. So, you can see all the parts of the check. You have the payee, which is who the money is going to. The date, obviously. Checks are only good for six months. So, a lot of people think that once they hand a person a check that they've written, that that's gone, it's out of their account. Not necessarily the case. That person technically has six months to take that check to the bank, cash it, or deposit it for it to clear your account. Does that make sense? So when you write a check and that person doesn't take it right away, does it go through your account? Right? If I write a check to Mr. Belines and he doesn't take it right away for 50 bucks, just because I wrote a check for 50 bucks, if he hadn't cashed it yet, it hadn't come out of my account. The problem with that is, if I don't keep track of it, now what? He, 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 he takes it to his bank, and he cashes it three months later, I forgot about it. Does that make sense? See where that can happen? There's a difference between when you wrote it and when it clears. Okay? Sorry, Paige. We've got a question over here. Where we got a question? Yes? Do you work? Good question. Do work paychecks work the same as a regular check? So you received a check from your employer. You have six months technically to deposit that check, but obviously you're going to want to get it in the bank as soon as possible. And um, so you're going to take that check to the bank or deposit it through your mobile app. Um, and depending on the criteria, the bank will have to look into it, see how many times we've seen that check, if we can verify funds, if we're comfortable with the check. That check can typically be made available to you the next day. Does that answer your question? Okay. Everybody know what we mean when we say made available? Just because you deposit a check, does that always mean if you, if you come deposit a check um, of $5,000, right? Addie gets her first signing bonus for playing professional basketball and comes and deposits it, right? For a million dollars into the bank. Is the whole million available the next day? Let's talk about one. So some things that we're looking out for that hopefully you guys are aware of that does happen is fraud schemes. We see a lot of people receive just a check in the mail and they think that's great. All I have to do is deposit this check and send this person back 3000 of it and I get to put decals on my car and I get to keep the rest. No. We see that so much. Check fraud is so, so, so common. Um, if you're not expecting a check, it's probably not real. Um, so the reason we take our time with checks and hold making it available is because things like that are so common. We're trying to protect ourselves, but we're also trying to protect you guys. Um, because whenever those checks do get returned as fraudulent, your checking account goes negative and that money is owed to the bank. Does that make sense? You have $500 in your account currently, okay? You have $500 in your account right now. Okay, you know. Okay, she probably has more. You get a check that's not, that's not right, it's fake, whatever, $2,000. You come to the bank and we make it available. We make it all available. We give you $2,000 back immediately. Make the funds available immediately. You go out, you spend $2,000. We actually didn't know that check was fake. You've already spent $2,000 because you thought you had $2,500. Because you added 2,000 to 500. Everybody following me? Tell me if you're not. It's okay. You think you have 2,500 in there. 
You spend the two thousand. Turns out the check was wrong. Fake. That two thousand dollars we sent when we send the check through to the other bank, the fraudulent check, they send it back and say that money's not real. The two thousand is gone. Now who's out the money? Really, Kate, right? But the bank is. We made it available. We can take her 500 that she had and try to apply it to that loss of 2000 But other than that, so when people, even some of your parents, I'm not knocking them, it's, people just don't know. They'll be like, why is that not available immediately? Like, well, we haven't verified funds, right? That check is from Wells Fargo in... Florida, and we haven't talked to Wells Fargo and had them say, that's legit, that $2,000 is headed your way. We don't know that. So we give it to you immediately, make it available immediately, right? It's not. So that's why people get upset sometimes. They'll say, and sometimes we'll make available the amount that's in your account. Why would we do that? If we have, so we can track it, right? If we make 500 available, we know we're at least covered for the amount that you already have in there. Does that make sense? We say, okay, you've got 500 now. We'll give you 500 of this check available because worst case scenario, now this is not always how this works. Right? You're, yeah, you're doing good. But we could, in other words, I'm just trying to tell you, we might, our availability could also be on how much is in your account. If you're willing to cover it, go for it. If it comes back and it wasn't, it wasn't real money, then you have enough money in your account to cover it. Sorry. So fraud isn't the only reason that a check can get returned. It could also be returned for insufficient funds. So the person who wrote you that check didn't account for it and now they don't have the money to cover it. So it gets returned and will also be deducted from your account. Another reason a check could get returned would be a stop payment. So if there was an issue with the issuer and they decided, hang on, that wasn't right. So they put a stop payment on the check so it won't clear their account. And yeah, so we're just really looking out for you. If we're going to place a hold, it's typically for your benefit. We're trying to protect you and your funds and just keep everything safe. So the rest of the parts of the check could be the check number, um, which is really just for your benefit to help you track where you're spending your money. And um, the memo line is just a place for you to write what the check is for. So say you're paying for your school pictures or whatever. And the signature is how we verify that it was actually you who wrote the check. So we're going to compare that to a signature that we have on file for you. Uh, the written amount is actually the legal line. So that's the amount of the check that we have to go by. It really doesn't matter what is in this numeric amount box. It's only what is in the legal line that matters. We'll have a lot of people bring a check by um, and those values don't match. And we do have to go by the legal line whether that's a smaller amount or not. Does anybody have any questions on how to write a check? Does that all make sense? You have an idea of how it becomes available? Great time to ask, for real. You write a check, everybody understands how you write it, how it becomes available. Makes sense? What happens if you write a check or swipe your card? We'll get to cards here in a minute. And you, we've got on our outline an NSF fee. Is it, what is an NSF fee? Insufficient funds. Insufficient funds. Do you want those? No. Right? You go out, you write a check for $200, come to find out you've got $100 in your account. Pretty simple. $100 won't cover a $200 check. You've heard, I don't know if your parents ever said it like I did, your, your mouth's writing checks that your butt can't, can't catch. Right? That's what that means. You get your, your somewhere you shouldn't be. Right? So, there's... Can we go ahead and let that check go through? Can we, if we want to? Yes. Yes? We can. But we'll charge you a insufficient funds fee, potentially. Is that right? We can let it go through and say, hey, they're good for it. They're good for it. Right? We could do it. Right? They'll pay it, they'll, they'll cover it, but we are going to charge you a fee. Do we have fees paid? Do you want to talk about how fees work? 
So for overdrawing your account, we have a program called Overdraft Protection. Basically, we allow you to overdraw your account up to $400 if you meet certain criteria. Uh, it's a 45-day period that we watch your account. Uh, we want to make sure that you don't go negative at all during that period and that you have sufficient deposits in that time to cover any overdraft privilege that we would give you. Um, up until about two months ago, we did charge insufficient funds fees. It was $25 for each item that overdrew you. So if you swipe your card at tar Starbucks for $6, it costs you another $25. If you go to Target after that for $15, that's another $25 negative in your account. But we actually got rid of those just a couple of months ago, so now you can overdraw your account without the additional fees being charged. What, how much can they do it? Up to $400. Did you say that? No, I don't know. That. <laughs> I wasn't listening. Thank you, Derek. Sorry. So, do we want to do that? No. But if you got in a bind, is it nice to know that you can do that? Right? Is that something you might want to think about when you're looking at a bank? Yeah. If bank B, again, I got a lot of buddies that are bankers. I'm mostly the youngest, so if they come and talk to you, make sure they know that. Okay? But the legacy guy is the younger one that's a lot more fun to already talking. But if you're choosing another bank, and they don't pay, or they have insufficient funds fees, and they're gonna charge you 25 bucks every time you accidentally, oh man, and another bank is not gonna charge you anything, what do you, what do you think you wanna go with? Okay, moving along. Okay, next up is depositing items. So this is an example of an endorsement that you would do if you're gonna deposit through the mobile app. So through the mobile app with Legacy, you can take a picture of a check that you have in your hand, say you can't make it to the bank before it closes, or you, really just don't want to deal with people, which is totally fair. You can take a picture of that on your smartphone and deposit it through the mobile app. They do require some specific endorsements. It's just a federal regulation. We have to be able to track that the check was deposited so that we don't have people taking a picture of it, putting it in one bank, and then physically driving it to another bank and trying to deposit it there as well. So you have to sign your name, add the words for mobile deposit only, the date you're depositing it, the bank, and your account number. Make sense? Move it along. This is just a blank deposit slip. So if you were depositing your check at the branch, either you would fill this out or the banker, if they're really nice, would fill it out for you. Um, you're just gonna put the date, your name, uh, your account number, the total amount of the deposit. There's also a spot here for you to sign for less cash received. So if you have a $100 check and you wanna hold $20 out, you'll change your deposit amount to 80 and sign for the cash received, and we can do that all in one fell swoop. Makes sense? No dumb questions, for real. Again, there's plenty of adults who don't understand some of this, so don't, it is not dumb. It's tricky. Okay. So with a physical deposit, unless it's cash or a check going to the same bank that it's payable from, so if you're at Legacy depositing a Legacy check, that's as good as cash, it'll be available immediately for you. Any other check, you have $225 available that day, unless we decide to hold the full amount. Um, the rest is typically available the next business day, but we can hold it for up to seven days if it doesn't meet our criteria or we feel like we need longer to take a look at it. So ways to avoid that would be a direct deposit. So if you have payroll, I would suggest that you get set up on direct deposit, which is an automatic transfer to your account by your routing and account number. Those are available immediately to you, no matter the amount. Makes sense. Going back to the good question earlier, does that make sense? You get paid, if you get on payroll and you get your paycheck in there automatically, do you have to wait? No. Another cool thing about direct deposit with Legacy is that we actually change over our computer systems every night to the next business day. So as long as we have received your direct deposit file by 2.30 and the day prior to you getting paid, you'll actually get your paycheck that evening around 7.30 or 8 because we switch over to the next day a little bit right here. Just a fun little work. Does everybody understand as we talk about this over and over, you're going to hear multiple times about available, availability that even though your generation, which is not that far from my generation, you're having these real-time, almost real-time things happen. It's not, it's not always actually real-time. You have a business day in there. You have an, uh, does that make sense? Does that kind of make sense? That's one of the hardest things for people sometimes is the timing of when the money goes in and out. It doesn't always just, it can't be instantaneous sometimes, even when you're getting paid. 
Okay. Okay, so next I want to take you guys through kind of what our mobile app looks like. This is our login screen. So you'll set up your own username and password. You can also link it to your face ID so you don't have to remember your password, which is nice. And um, this is the mobile deposit screen. Everything's blurred out, obviously, for privacy, but um, you'll take an image of the front and back of your check, and you'll select the account that you want it to go into, write the amount, and we can get it deposited for you without you having to bring it. And this would be your view of your accounts. It gives you your total available balance through all of your accounts. So if you have a checking and a savings account, it's going to give you the total of both of those. And then you have the option to make a transfer, make a deposit, or view a statement. Sorry, baby. Nope. One of the things we're supposed to, we're going to, you know, the curriculum that they talked about that they want you all to kind of learn is balancing a checkbook. Does anybody... Does anybody balance their checkbook? Does anybody have a check you do? Good. So you, that at least teach you mathematically. How many of you have a mobile app that you look at your checking account? Okay. Very good. Good to be able to do both. We know more than likely most people in today's world, you're gonna check, you're gonna be on your mobile app, right? So you gotta pay attention. Because if you're not going to get out and look at everything by hand and see where all your checks are and what, where you spent your money and how many times you swiped your card at White Buffalo or wherever, then you're not going to know how much money you have available. You've got to be able to use, we just know this generation is mostly going to be using your mobile app. On, online, whatever, you're going to be doing it somehow online. So here would be our transfer screen so you can move money uh, from your checking to your savings, never the other way around. I'm just kidding. It happens. Um, so there's that. And then here you can see your statements. Again, you keep seeing on the account here where it says available balance. That is, um, it's really important because that's what you have that you could spend right then. So if you have a hold on a check, it's not going to be a part of your available. If you have a hold on your debit card, that's not going to be a part of your available balance. So that's what you could get basically out of an ATM right then. I, um, I can't help but to yeah, continue to, to hit this over and over again. Now you're starting to see why when you get your phone out, there's a chance if you deposit a check in the morning, you ran by Legacy Bank, you deposit a check for $500, you go to Oklahoma City, you're at the mall, you look on your phone, and you've only got 300 available. You're like, I just put $500 in there this morning. Do you want to go ahead and spend the extra money or do you want to go off of what's available? What's available. All right. Mr. Noel, we're making progress. Yeah. One other thing I want to mention on the available balance. Whenever you swipe your debit card, you'll see on your app that it's automatically deducted from your available balance, but that's going to hang out in your current balance for a couple of days. So if you swipe your card at Starbucks, I just love coffee, so I'm always going to use that. But if you swipe your card at Starbucks for $6, you'll see that it'll stay in your current balance but come out of your available balance. A merchant actually has 45 days before they have to batch out their terminal. So you could have a card hold for as long as 45 days before it finally falls off. So that's why it's so, so, so important that you stick to that available balance and not the current because you don't want to be spending money that you don't actually have that you've already promised to somebody else. So what does that mean? That's really good. The stuff that I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know it, but I promise you, and I've seen you in high school. You swipe your card and it may not show up in your account for how long? 45 days. See what I'm saying? Even when you're really working and keeping track, that's, that's not your, I mean, it's not necessarily your fault. You could be really paying attention. That's you just kind of have to know. There's that's another one of those delays. You swipe it, and they don't actually take it out of your account. So you're looking, and you're like, I, I know I went to Starbucks and spent 15 bucks, and it hadn't come out yet. They have 45 days to run their batch for their system to clear. In other words, and your money to actually show up that it came out of your account. It's tricky. That's why you have to have plenty in there. That's also why some people can have insufficient funds occasionally. They didn't, they didn't mean to. They didn't, they're like, why is this just not coming through, right? Okay. Another thing with debit cards is you have to be mindful of your card being skimmed or your information being taken on the internet. So fraudulent schemes can happen there too. Also, if you're physically swiping your card, there's a little thing called a skimmer. 
that people will put on the debit card reader that will basically steal all of the credit card information as you swipe it. They're really, really thin, they're hard to see. Um, scammers are getting smarter and smarter every day, so that's another reason to keep a good eye on your account. If you see something that you don't recognize, call the bank immediately and we'll get you taken care of. We do have a third party that monitors all transactions on all of our accounts that are watching to see any activity that's out of normal, basically. So if you have a transaction at four in the morning and you're not usually swiping your card at that time, there's a good chance that we'll temporarily turn off your card until we can verify that transaction with you. And if it turns out the transaction was fraudulent, we'll keep that debit card closed while disputes is needed and try to get your money back for you. Do you guys have any questions on fraud or disputes? What happens if you never go through after he's asking what happens? Good question. I'm sorry. No. Eli? What happens if it never goes through during that 45 day period? After the 45 days, the pre authorization that the merchant obtained from your debit card is no longer valid. So they don't have a right to the funds anymore and the hold will fall off of your card. If something weird happens and they do decide that they want to pull those funds anyway, it's a fraudulent charge at that point and we'll work with Visa to get your money back. So you could eat for free if, it's all, if that's their fault, if they didn't run it within 45 days, right? Okay. Any other questions on disputes or fraud? Anything? Okay. Next. ATM? Yeah, so ATMs are great. You can go in the middle of the night and pull out money, or again, if you don't want to talk to people, um, it's typically only in $20 increments, and again, that is only what is in your available balance. And most ATMs, if you are a customer of that bank, will charge a, a fee for you, so they're anywhere from a dollar to six dollars even. Um, so be mindful of where you're using the ATM. Try to stick with an ATM that's owned by your bank to avoid those unnecessary fees. And um, also very soon, Legacy Bank has an ITM that will be brought live. And at the ITM, you can deposit a check, you can deposit cash, you can cash a check. Um, so it's an interactive teller machine, so you can basically do anything that a regular teller would be able to do for you. Does that make sense? We're this close to having it. They're already out there, but I mean, you're, we're gonna have one here in Weatherford, at Legacy, where you'll pull up and you can basically have an interactive, well, you can. You can pull up on a Saturday morning, whether there's a teller there or not, and you'll be able to have an interactive transaction with the, with the machines. Instead of just getting cash out, you'll be able to do all kinds of stuff. Okay? Question? So, that, is that only available the ITM, it will only be available for legacy customers, so you'll only be able to do transactions on your legacy account. It's hard to imagine banking somewhere else, isn't it? I'm, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, for those, it'll only be legacy. Now, but, but that leads to a good question. Obviously, can you get money out of an ATM from another bank if you bank somewhere else? By the way, you, you can't tell your dad. You know, a good friend with Mr. Amon. There's other banks, so um, they're good. They're good too. Um, can you get money out of another ATM somewhere else when you're in Oklahoma City? Obviously, if you're what if I mean, I go. To, we go to California. Um, my family does. Uh, I'm obviously a legacy guy. Can I get money out of an ATM there? Okay, how's that work? You may know. Yes. There is a fee. There is. So how does that work and what can you ever get those fees waived? So there's going to be a fee at the ATM from the ATM, but a lot of times your institution will also charge you a fee for using a foreign ATM. At Legacy, one of our accounts, it's the win-win account, it's our interest-bearing account. If you, As long as you pull out $100 at that ATM, we'll reverse our fee for you. Does that make sense? I'm in California, I need $300. Obviously, I don't have a legacy ATM. There's no legacies in California. I go ahead and pay the $3 fee, and then I hope that when I get back later on, I look at my statement, and our bank has waived my fee because of some things that I did on our account that have allowed them to waive it for me. 
right? Some, some accounts have that, some accounts don't. If you don't, not a huge deal. Just know that you're paying three bucks to get your 300. Did you have a question? So do you have to ask your bank to change it or do automatically? It depends on the type of the account that you have, but the win-win account, it'll automatically waive all those fees for you. Great question. It, that's part of the, how the account's set up. That's like a perk of that particular account is that it waives fees. Uh, not all, but in that case. Okay, so while we're talking about statements and fees, let's go ahead and just talk about what a statement is. A statement is an official transcript that you get that will show every transaction on your account for the month. It'll also have all the check images that you wrote and all of the deposit slip images for checks that you deposited into your account. Whenever you receive this, you have 60 days to review it and get with the bank if there are any discrepancies in the accounting that you've kept and what's shown on the statement. So if you have a weird ACH uh, debit on your account to PayPal that you didn't do, you have 60 days to let us know for us to work on that and get you your money back. Does that make sense? You're gonna get more talks later, a lot more, as you start to move up this over the next few months. One of them's gonna be uh, maybe Cody, I don't know. I know Andy, one of our other officers from Legacy is going to come. He's going to talk about borrowing money. You get ready to buy a house or whatever, and they ask for your tax return and your bank statement. Why do they want that? See what you're doing. Verify that you can pay for the house. Right? So you also want to look at know how to pull up your bank statement. Your parents' generation, they did two things. Mostly wrote paper checks. And they mostly looked at paper bank statements. You will probably never do either one of those things. You, I mean, you write a paper check. Tell me wrong. You write some paper checks. Almost all you're going to do is write there. But you have to keep up with it. So you're going to be able to pull up your bank statement online and be able to look through there and see where everything went. Make sense? No dumb questions. Okay. Yes. Good question. So the win-win account for us is an interest-bearing account. So you earn interest based on how much you're spending. So with that account, if you spend $1,000 a month, you get 1% on the first 15,000 in your checking account, 2,000, 2% all the way up to 5%. And then from 15,000 up to 100,000, you get 1.5%. So you get a win-win rate for what you're spending and then a money market rate for anything above 15,000. Um, and then that also comes with the other perks of getting those ATM fees waived and other things like that. The square one, the first account that we talked about, is the cash back account. Um, and that one is really just designed for lower volume customers. So our kind of magic number is 6,500. So if your average balance for the month is going to be less than 6,500, typically the square one is more profitable for you. Does that make sense? Yes. I just like to... They're both free accounts. We don't have any fees for either one of those. Debit cards are free and we can print those in the lobby in about 10 minutes. Another good question. Do all banks have that or just legacy? These are great questions. I like to yell after the page has already explained everything. So, these two accounts are legacy. So, a lot of times you'll hear we have free checking for years. All that means is there's no fee, right? Um, and I'm not bragging on legacy on this, in this situation. I'm really not. The, we have always been big on paying on checking accounts. Where do you get paid most of the time? On your savings account, right? Most of the time, you're earning interest on money that's in a savings account, like a CD, right? Does everybody understand how that works? Great question. A savings account is typically something, Andy, that you're gonna have, that, where you're, you don't intend on using that account a lot, You've put $10,000 over here to earn interest, and you'd prefer it stay there. Unless you're gonna go buy a car and you need to get some money out of there to add to it, it's, it's a place that you wanna earn. So as you earn interest on that $10,000, we're gonna talk about credit card interest here in a minute, which is the opposite, that's where you're paying interest. The bank is paying you, I'm gonna spit it over here, 2% on that $10,000, right? And then a lot of times people will have a checking account that's, that's called their transaction account. That's usually where you're paying your electric bill. You're paying to go to Oklahoma City and eat. You're paying to, that's the difference primarily between a checking account 
and a savings account. A savings account, I would prefer to put money over here to the side and not use it. A checking account, I'm using it almost every day. Every time I go swipe at Walmart, I use it. That's money that's going in and out all the time. Okay? So, that's very important. You have to think, how much do I need in my checking account? Because I would rather be getting paid on my money, right? So if I can put more in my savings, that's, that money is earning. Now some savings accounts, like a money market account, which is, we, we're, not, we're gonna get into deep here, you can pull out a few times a month. It doesn't mean you can't take that money out. It's just not what we consider your working account. Does that make sense? So a checking, you're writing checks out of, a savings typically you don't have it most of the time, sometimes, most of the time, you're not going to have a card tied to it or something that you're using consistently. Is that multiple questions? Yes. So, it's all right. But with the pay stubs on the back of your check, yeah. you check your job, your pay stubs. How does that help? Because I've been told to save them up for tax return and all that. How does that? Help? Great question. He asked, "How? Why does it help? Why am I told to keep my pay stubs?" Well, the same reason that you, they're going to ask for, like, potentially your bank statement. Sometimes when you're getting a loan or they're trying to verify your income, they'll ask you for your pay stubs. Other, otherwise, your accountant may ask for your pay stubs because they want to know how much taxes have you already paid. Did we reconcile this properly? Right? So they say, hey, go ahead and hold on to your pay stubs so we make sure at the end of the year we have all 24 up or whatever if you get paid twice a month or whatever. Right? So that's why. So they can, you can make sure you reconcile it. Good question. Great question. So many good questions. I can't get enough Chick-fil-A cards today. Typically a monthly. They take we're gonna take we're gonna look at your account and we're gonna look at how much interest, I mean how much what your balance was, did you meet the criteria? Um, and we're gonna decide not decide, there's a calculation, and at the end of the month you'll see money go back into your account at Legacy. So the difference in what she was saying is, okay, this is kind of important too. And, and it'll, it'll, it'll go into my credit card deal here in just a second. There's transaction fees that you earn sometimes from swiping in a card, a swiping a card. You can actually earn money back for that, right? And then there's interest earned. If I've got $10,000 sitting over here in a savings account and it's earning 2%, that means it's earning 2% annually on that $10,000. That's interest that we're just paying you. If you have a square one account, which is also a checking account, we're not paying you on the balance of 10,000. We don't really care as long as you don't overdraw it if you have 10,000 or 600. We're paying you every time you go to Walmart and swipe. <coughs> Does that make sense? So if you go to Walmart and swipe it for $100, that's a higher fee for that transaction. Legacy gets paid on that because you used our card, thank you, right? Our little thank you to you is we put in a dollar. A dollar. You swipe it at Walmart for a hundred dollars, we put in a dollar. You run by McDonald's and swipe for 25 bucks, we pay you a quarter. A quarter. At the end of the month, regardless of whether you have $10,000 or whether you have $500 as a balance, we look at how many times you swiped your card and we add up all those quarters and dollars, and that's the amount we put in your account. And it's monthly. Does that make sense? That's totally separate from your balance. That's on card swipes. That's why a lot of our college, like y'all's age and a lot of our college, it's great. You may not have 50000 to earn interest, but you're swiping your card, and that's all we're paying you for. Yes? Oh, that's a great question. That's that's where it gets complicated. Um, that's a Chick Fil A card question. She asked to be clear. Let's say that she increases her balance halfway through the month, right? So she had five thousand, and halfway through the month she puts another five thousand in. How does that work? Because half the month she had five thousand, half the month she had ten thousand. Make sense? Is that what you're asking, right? Okay. That's why you're going to look at the opposite when you get. When we get to credit cards, we'll have to hurry. But you asked a great question. 
It's, an, it's, it's based on your annual percentage yield. That interest rate is calculated over a, six, over a daily rate. So it actually is both. It's going to be able to calculate, all this is math, but it's all computerized now. It's going to know half the month was 5, half the month was 10. It'll give you credit for both. And it'll do both, and at the end of the month, it'll have calculated the first half and the second math and the second half by the day. And that's how much will go in your account. Yes? That's right, for the square one, for one of the for one of our checking accounts. Yeah. Does it matter how much like you get into the special card? Like say like sometimes like it's just a bar Yeah. That's what we're talking about. So ours has got levels. So hundred dollars is a dollar back to you. Fifty dollar or what is that? Twenty five. Twenty five is a quarter. Yep. Right? So it just kind of follows along. It's kinda of like having your own little savings plan. But you don't even really know you're doing. You don't have to mean it. We just keep track of all of it for you, okay? As long as your transaction is over ten dollars, you're gonna earn something. And one of the lessons, besides you guys understanding the, the actual fundamentals of how that's working, is that what I hope you're hearing is you should always be trying to make money with your money, not paying me. You don't want to be paying me for insufficient fees. You want me paying you for having your money in my bank. Does that make sense? I'm talking the rest of your life. Every time you have a thought, what is this doing? Obviously, when I go buy, buy a new pair of Nike shoes, Nike doesn't pay me. I know you can't do that with everything. You have to, you're buying things. But if it's an investment or a place that you're putting your money, your question's got to be, am I paying them or are they paying me? When you borrow money, which you're going to talk about later in the year, you can't help it. You're going to have to pay me. I'm giving you way more money than you had. You're going to pay me a fee for it in the terms of interest. But if you're depositing or you've got a checking account, you make people pay you. Does that make sense? Okay. You're up. Am I up? You are. Okay, you want to pull up the basics? Is that first? Okay. Yes. So we just have a minute to talk about credit cards, which I don't necessarily... <laughs> Does anybody have a credit card? Okay. Be real careful how you, what you tell your parents about what Mr. Roper or some of them know me, what Derek said about credit cards, okay? Because it's, this is a tricky little subject, but it's really important because young people, like, they get them very quickly. Um, you can't hardly talk about a credit card without talking about your credit score. I don't, we don't have the time to go into all of it, but you have a credit score that tells the whole world, the whole financial world, what your history is. It basically says, how responsible are you? Okay? Right? And you want that score to be high. I forgot to grab my credit card statement. I'm going to show you a statement. That's my bad. Okay? On your statement, it's going to tell you what your balance is, kind of like a bank account. The reality is, having a credit, having a loan, like a mortgage or a new car, and paying on that consistently, that builds your history, okay? So here's what I'm going to tell you. Some people, if, anybody ever heard of Dave Ramsey? Right? Financial guy. Okay. Very good financial guy. He kind of believes strongly in no credit card at all. And the problem with a credit card is, is that do you have to have funds? All this time we talked about how much funds are available in your checking account or your savings account and how that works so that you can keep track of it, right? And then you get to a credit card, do you have to have any funds available? It's not funds available. It's you swiping, and, you're, and that is a loan every time you swipe it. They are giving you that money. So the first thing I will tell you before you tell your parents that I said they were great, I'm not telling you they're great. Now, I'm also not telling you that I'm a believer necessarily in zero. What I will tell you is they are going to allow you to do some things, including build your credit. Your credit goes all the way up to like 850. Most people that have a great credit score, it's somewhere between 700, 800, a little over 800, okay? If you don't make a payment and they report it, I don't care if it's your, it doesn't matter what it is. A health, you have a, I feel sorry for some people, you'll see on their credit score where they didn't pay a doctor bill, maybe they couldn't afford it. They report that to the credit bureaus, right? You can talk about credit scores at some point. 
Okay, good. I won't get you. I'll, I'll stop it. So the credit card, because you're showing how you pay it, they will, that can help you with your score. Here's the problem. If you have a credit card that's got a 17% ADR, let's talk real quickly about how you would calculate that. You take 17%, APR is annual percentage rate, right? So every time you think annual, it's not that hard. It's just 365. So you take the rate that they're telling you, which is 17, to take 0.17, divide by 365, and you're going to get 0.0466, okay? That's your rate. You're actually, if you do that, you calculate it real quick, you're going to get like 0.00046, whatever. you got to turn it into a percentage. So you're going to get, that's your daily rate. That goes back to what we were talking about earlier when you're earning. What's your name? I'm sorry. Audrey asked a great question. She said, what if I put in more money during the middle of the month? We start paying her more because we figure out, we calculate it daily. Okay? Well, so does the credit card company the other way. You've swiped it. You've got $2,000. You go to the next one. So you go to the next, uh, so now your daily rate is 0.0466. You've got $2,000 hanging out there where you went on a, a, a bench somewhere uh, in Oklahoma City. And now on that $2,000 over a 25-day period, which usually it's like 30, over 25 days, you owe them 23 extra dollars on that 2000 you spent. What did we just talk about? Do you want to pay people for your money or do you want people to pay you for your money? You can change your whole world. Pay attention to that. If you have a $2,000 balance. If you have a $2,000 balance. Now, do they charge that to you if you pay it off in full? No. That means you carry that balance and don't pay it. If you pay the minimum, you can pay the minimum. It doesn't hurt your credit score. So listen to me. Let's say you have $2,000 balance out there. And they tell you that your minimum is 150 bucks that month. If you pay that $150, your credit score, it's good, right? You paid the minimum that the credit card company told you to pay. So your credit's fine. You did not miss a payment. That does not mean you missed a payment. You paid American Express or Discover or whoever. You paid the minimum, which is what they want you to do. But you owe them that. That doesn't mean it's all negative. Let me tell you the positive. If I put that on there for six months, I'm not, this is going to sound arrogant. I'm just giving you the other example. I do it. I pay it off every month. Guess how I pay if I want to go to the Bahamas? They pay me. Not the whole trip, but they'll pay for my flights. You know why? Because I pay the 2000 every time. I don't pay them. They pay me points. See the difference? Part of you, if you're not careful, are going to be paying $23 a month, and that part of you that's doing that is paying me to go to the Bahamas, or the other half that's going to figure it out. That's it. I'm telling you. From here forward, you'll be like, I remember that tall, bald guy. That's what I'm telling you. Half of you are going to figure it out. And you're going to be like, I'm paying that off every month. And you'll swap your American Express card and you'll know exactly $1,200. I'm paying that off. I'm not doing any more than I have to. And they're going to go, we give you airline miles. And the other jack wagon is going to be over there paying $23 a month in interest. Right? And American Express, the only way they can help pay you for your credit card miles is because somebody wouldn't pay their balance. How else do you think they make money? How could they be paying me? How could Discover Card pay you cash back? Transaction fees, right? Transaction fees, like we talked about, just swipe the card. And other people that aren't paying their end, they're making tons. So I'm not telling you, my suggestion would be first of all, just like I tell the young people in our bank, if you're gonna get a car, if you're gonna get a car, and they will pray on, on you when you go to college. I don't mean pray like, like I pray for you. I pray for a lot of you. I mean they're gonna pray on you like, hey, they're young, they're gonna, they might want a car. When you get to college, you have some freedom. Find a car that pays you for something like cash back. You guys may not be going on flights. 
And you make sure you have a couple things you use it for. Some of you have heard this before from your parents already. You have a couple things you know you're going to have to have. Not like I went out and bought whatever I wanted. I'm tempted. I just went and bought it. Gas, something that you're going to do. I know I'm going to spend $60 on gas every month or $90 or $150, whatever it is now. Okay? And then you pay it off what? In full. In full. Questions real quick on a credit card. There's a lot more to it. Yes, sir. Great question. What would you look for in a credit card? I'm going to keep it real simple, and it's great. First of all, do you want that fee to be high or low? Okay? Do you want the interest rate to be high or low? Low. Now, I will tell you, I don't intend on paying interest. So for me, I can tell you what I look for. What's my reward? Discover typically is what? You see it on commercials all the time. What is it? Cash back. What is most of American Express? Reward. Okay? Points. So you want to look for what fits me. Okay? I want something probably y'all's age that's going to pay me a little bit of cash back. Something simple. Because we can all use cash, right? Other questions? I know we're getting late. Sorry. Yes? So, like, with the interest charge, what if you don't, like, use your full balance? Like, say my balance is $2,000 for that month, but I only spend 1000 and I'm still going to use the interest charge? Yeah. They're going to charge you interest. She said, what if I, what if I pay? Am I asking this right? If you had a $2,000 balance on your American Express card and you paid 1000 which means you left 1000 right? Well, like you only spent 1000 Oh, the two thousand is just a number. That's if you did spend. It. Oh, okay. The two thousand is what you spent. Okay. That's insinuating that you spent two thousand. It could be twenty thousand. Okay. It could be fifteen hundred. You're only going to earn interest on what you. I mean, I'm sorry. They're only going to charge you interest on what you. But here's the deal. This is important too. Let's say you pay your minimum. Okay. But they that two thousand dollars is now two thousand twenty-three. Right. And the next month you pay your minimum again. Now you're paying, now they're charging you 17% on $2,023. So now that $2,023 earns a little bit more, so the next month they're charging you $2,046. Do you see why people get messed up in this deal? Like a train that they can't get off of? Or a spinning wheel? Because it, not, the interest goes in there, they charge it to you, you're late. Then that, that increases your balance, and now you're paying interest on that bigger balance. Does that make sense? It's called compounding interest. Is that now you're paying them again for the money that you used two months ago? Is that clear? Questions? Anything else? No? Are we good? Are we cover what we're supposed to? Hey, y'all have been fantastic. Will you do me a favor real quick before you go lunch? <coughs> the guy I was talking about that hands out Chick-fil-A does it for you. I know a lot of you have been student of the month, right? We give more Chick-fil-A cards out. Weatherford grad, amazing guy. He'll be here to speak to you. Can you give me like a, like a thanks Aaron and get, is that, what's, I don't know, it's cheesy, but like a thanks Aaron, go Eagles, something like that? Can y'all do that on three? <laughs> if I count it out? Okay, let me, let me, we'll go quiet and then just thanks Thanks, thanks, Aaron. Go Eagles. Or whatever you want to do with your hands. Except for, you can't do something inappropriate. Yeah. Right? Right? So we're going thanks, Aaron, on three. We're quiet before that. Ready? Thanks, Aaron. Go Eagles.